evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'm not going to read out Adam's talk. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, welcome to this last for the year of our uh, series of Meet the Researchers, and uh, these have been going on since about February this year. Uh, still not the last events for the year. We have, for ex example, the um, Tom and Ethan lecture the week after next with Frank Ferreri, and uh, in, in uh, sorry, in uh, December. I think we have two events early December, so uh, if you're on our list to receive events at the centre, you'll know a lot about that anyway. It's my pleasure to introduce Adam Crichton to us. Adam joined us earlier in the year um, as one of our new economists. The other one was Alex, there he is, Alex over here. And uh, he uh, was a graduate of the University of New South Wales and started his career at the Reserve Bank and the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority uh, for s well, he also says here from six years, from 1995, he was an award-winning checkout operator at Woolworths. Uh, his areas of expertise include financial markets and services, tax and fiscal policy, superannuation and political economy. He came to the CIS uh, from uh, being an advisor to the uh, senior advisor to the leader of the opposition and economic advisor to the shadow assistant treasurer. He spent six months at The Economist in London in 2009 writing for the finance and arts pages. It's all ri also written for The Spectator, both here in Australia, uh, in England? Yeah. Well, yeah, both here in England, wherever I am. I was in England on the weekend, that's why I said that. <laughs> Pol Policy Review, The American Spectator, and co-authored a chapter for Oxford University Press on funded re retirement schemes. He's got a Master of Philosophy in Economics from Oxford, and it's my pleasure to ask him to talk about what is really one of the most important issues at the moment, especially for those who see markets going down, <laughs> and they seem to be going down yet again. Adam. Okay, thanks, Greg. Okay, well, thank you for coming to hear about superannuation. <coughs> uh, superannuation must surely win the prize for the area of public policy which is most likely to induce drowsiness. So I think you all deserve a pat on the back for coming. Um, not only is the word a mouthful, but for most people it's of no relevance here and now. It serves purposes far into the future, and moreover, it can prompt thoughts of uh, sedentary living, of ageing, of our twilight years and mortality. And so perhaps this explains why superannuation in Australia is such a mess, because no one really wants to think much about it. Uh, superannuation might be boring, but it's also massively important. Uh, few Commonwealth government incursions have such widespread effect. Uh, superannuation, uh, compulsorily, redirects 9% of, of workers' incomes, or about $60 billion a year, into accounts that workers can't touch until they retire. Uh, the tax concessions provided uh, by the government to taxpayers, uh, these are classified as tax expenditures for superannuation, uh, these are about $33 billion uh, each year. So this is very substantial. This is uh, more than half the revenue of the GST, say, and um, it's more than the entire cost of the age pension. So these are just the tax concessions provided for superannuation. Now this is a good time to be thinking about super because many changes have been considered. Uh, the inquiry into Australia's tax system, which is known as the Henry Review, uh, made recommendations that would see significant changes to the taxation of super. Meanwhile, the inquiry into the governance, efficiency, structure and operation of the superannuation system, which is thankfully known as the Cooper Review, made 177 recommendations that would also have a very widespread effect. And of course, then there's the government's plan to lift the compulsory rate of saving to 12%. And actually, this bill just, uh, just made its way into the parliament just this afternoon. So it's actually very relevant. Um, if this bill passes, uh, the increase in, in the compulsory rate to 12%, uh, I think this will probably be the biggest reform of the Rudd Gillard government, um, and certainly will probably, be the, will probably be the most enduring, uh, given the carbon tax and the mining tax looks set to be repealed, perhaps. So tonight, what am I going to do? Well, this is the outline. I'll first uh, review the development and the structure of the super system to try to bring everyone up to speed a bit on how we got to where we are. Uh, second, I'll explain what I consider the defects of the super system, and there are there are many of them. Um, and finally, I'll outline what, the, what Henry and Cooper both envisage, uh, just in broad terms for the system, and also present a one idea of my own. <coughs> so among Western countries, Australia was very unusual in the 20th century for not introducing a national retirement benefit scheme that is linked to earnings. Between the introduction of the old age pension in 1908 and the emergence of superannuation in the 1980s, there were no major structural changes to Australia's retirement provision. Uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, by contrast, they introduced national earnings link schemes in the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, Australia almost did as well in 1928, 1938, and 
1976, there were various government-sponsored committees which proposed uh, national social insurance schemes. Uh, but the happenstance of electoral change and, and also the Second World War meant that these three schemes were not carried through. Rather, occupational superannuation was at the discretion of employers and, has been, and, and had been taxed concessionally since income tax was introduced in Australia in 1915. So by 1974, about 32% of wage earners were covered by superannuation. The trend to compulsory retirement saving did not ultimately emerge from the considered recommendations of some uh, government committee, but instead it emerged from industrial action in the 1980s. The 1986 accord uh, between uh, unions and employers and the federal government as part of the then national wage case provided for a 6% compensation increase for employees that were covered by awards. Of that 6%, uh, 3%, or half I should say rather, was to be paid as superannuation. Uh, for the government, this arrangement was as much about uh, macroeconomic management as it was about microeconomics, because inflation at the time was very high, and national savings had been falling, and so the government also felt that a compulsory super policy would, uh, would help ameliorate those two problems. So in 1992, the government made superannuation saving compulsory for all workers up to 65 who earn more than $450 a month. And I might add that $450 a month has not changed since, so uh, despite, despite the intervening inflation. So coverage expanded and the superannuation guarantee gradually rose to 9%. So I've got a graph here with, with both coverage, uh, which is the blue. Now, this is employee coverage, not, not a coverage of everyone. So um, a broader coverage. So uh, the ABS estimates that Australia-wide coverage of people aged over 15 is 71%. So, so 93% of employees now have, have some exposure to super and 71% of Australians. Um, for anyone born after 1964, the preservation age for super is, is now 60, so that's when you can access your benefits. Um, and of course, superannuation excludes the self-employed, and that explains for the large gap between coverage of employees and a broader coverage. Um, now, the red line, of course, is the compulsory charge, and the increase from 2013 is assuming that this bill is passed, which is uh, currently in the Parliament, and that uh, will increase the rate gradually to 12 by 2020, <coughs> or sorry, 2019, I think. Um, so, <coughs> okay, um, so the introduction of super was very divisive. Um, it was opposed by the then Liberal opposition. There's a quote there from Senator Rod Kemp, and he's basically saying that, you know, this is a, it's kind of a, basically saying that super is more about uh, maintaining union power, basically, than, than any kind of a benevolent foresight for Australian workers. So, I mean, obviously the Labor Party would heavily dispute that, but that's, that was the Liberal Party's view at the time. Um, also, much of the debate at the time was, and still is, around who actually pays compulsory superannuation contributions, employers or employees. Um, although employers make the payments, uh, the economic arguments do suggest that employees bear the levy, much like they bear income tax. Um, compulsory superannuation was, without question, the Keating government's biggest legacy, and seemingly a very enduring one. The Howard government did not alter superannuation fundamentally. It introduced choice of fund in 2005, a co-contribution payment for low-income earners. It also fiddled with the tax structure a little, but that was largely it. Whatever you think of the system, it was certainly novel. Among advanced countries, only Switzerland introduced compulsory saving before Australia, and that was in 1985. And Chile was the first country, was the first of all countries in 1981. Since 1993, other OECD countries and developing countries have introduced variations of compulsory retirement saving too. And there remains a strong lobby for such a scheme in the United States. So by 1993, Australia had the three pillar retirement system that the World Bank has begun to advocate as the benchmark, uh, sorry, which the World Bank began to advocate as the benchmark from 1994. And that three pillar system is outlined here. So the three pillars are in blue. There's, uh, there's a safety net, and of course in Australia, our our safety net is a targeted one, so that means it's means tested. Um, now the, compul the second tier is, is the compulsory employer related part, and that's our, our publicly mandated, privately managed uh, superannuation scheme. Um, and the third pillar is voluntary saving. So that's how the World Bank classifies uh, retirement uh, schemes across countries, y using a schema like that. Um, the Australian system remains highly regarded around the world. Only last month, Mercer uh, claimed the Australian retirement system was the second best in the world uh, behind the Netherlands, which has a similar scheme to Australia. Now, you might wonder why our system is considered so good. So uh, the main reason, uh, like I've already suggested, is that Australia did not introduce a publicly provided 
system, which I've highlighted in that red box there. That's what most countries in the West have introduced at various times in the 20th century. So, so even if those schemes started out with good intentions, like for example, if they promised that specific taxes collected would be set aside and invested to provide for future pensions, that, that tended never to happen in reality. And these schemes basically turned into PAYG schemes where current taxation was funding current benefits. <coughs> and of course, when there's a demographic change going on, when the baby boomers are retiring, that causes massive, massive problems. And that's what we're seeing. So you know, part of the debt crisis in Europe and also in uh, the United States, to a lesser extent, is caused by these schemes. Um, there are also other arguments, though, for privately managed schemes, and these are that they improve national savings, that funds are insulated from political tampering, that they allow individuals to allocate savings with the risk return profile that they want, and that they encourage development of financial markets. I don't necessarily agree with all those, but certainly they're reasons that are put out to support a privately managed system like Australia has. Now, total superannuation assets. Well, in keeping with the coverage and rate of superannuation, uh, the increase of both of those, uh, total assets and super have grown significantly, as you can see. Um, so even with the GFC-induced dip, Australia's total super assets as of June exceeded $1.3 trillion. So that's the left axis. And then I've done it as a ratio of GDP as well. So you can see we're now just, uh, just below GDP. It's kind of meaningless having superannuation as a ratio to GDP, but it's, it's so commonly presented that way that I, I just thought I would as well. Because of course, one is a stock and one is a flow. So. Um, yeah, so in 2010, uh, just, uh, just by way of interest, Australia had the third largest pension funds um, under management as a fraction of the economy um, in the world, and that was behind the Netherlands and Iceland. So, so for our size, we have a lot of funds under management. <laughs> Iceland. I don't, I mean, maybe the Iceland data does need to be updated, perhaps I, I should have checked that. <laughs> and, um, um, okay, some more graphs. We've got lots of graphs coming, I'm just warning you. Um, as contributions to superannuation funds have grown as well, although 9% has been the minimum rate, the tax advantage status of super means that, um, uh, that in practice, the contributions have vastly exceeded 9%. Indeed, last year, 16% of total employee compensation was contributed to super funds. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everyone is uh, contributing 16%. There are massive variations across people, but uh, the employer contributions there, they are, they are steadier because they generally reflect the compulsory contributions, and, but, but they also include salary salary sacrifice contributions as well. So basically anything that the employer actually writes out in a check, that's in the red line. Um, anything that you write out in a check is in the green line um, when you're giving money to super. Uh, now the reason for the big spike there was some favorable tax changes in 2007. I'm not entirely sure on the details, but that basically forced a lot of people to bring forward their a movement of a voluntary contributions into super. Uh, it was part of the simpler super reforms. Um, now, who holds these assets? Well, there are um, they're held in funds overseen by trustees, and there are five broad types of funds. So firstly, SMSFs, or self-managed super funds. They now are the largest subsector, which is quite amazing. Their growth has been quite astounding. I can remember starting back at APRA in 2001, when they were considered quite a, you know, we just didn't really worry about them very much. And, and since that time, I started looking at super again just a couple of years ago, and, and I was just amazed at how that, that it's actually the biggest sector now. Um, so it's got over $400 billion in assets, and they have fewer than five members. So generally, these are husband and wife combinations, generally, almost, almost universally, um, people that manage their own superannuation. So they're the trustees, and they're the managers, if you like. So there's a lot of freedom. Uh, but there are some higher fixed costs. Um, now, these SMSFs are managed by the ATO and not by APRA. Now, that exact same chart, but this time as percentages of total assets, so you get a better idea of, of, um, of trends. So, so just briefly to tell you what these different types of funds are. So industry funds are not-for-profit entities that are set up by unions and employer associations. Uh, they're typically open to anyone, but historically they tended to serve workers in particular industries. Uh, now the biggest currently is Australian Super, which has $33 billion of assets. And now industry funds are somewhat controversial uh, because they enjoy a great market advantage. They are typically listed in the default funds in industrial awards, sorry, as the default fund in industrial awards. So if workers don't make a choice of super fund, their contributions automatically go to the industry fund that is specified in the relevant award. And so as you can imagine, that's a, that's a very, very lucrative position to have because there's actually not many people make a decision about their super, very few in fact. Uh, Louise Staley of the IPA last year examined 166 modern awards and found that uh, 477 industry funds were included and only 38 retail funds. So uh, the decision as to 
who's listed is basically made by the Industrial Relations Commission or, or whatever it's called now, Fair Work Australia. Um, so, yeah, you can imagine there's there's a lot of politics there. Um, retail funds are offered by major banks and insurance companies. They are for profit and they're typically open to anyone as well. The largest retail fund is AMP Superannuation Savings Trust, which has uh, forty three billion dollars of assets. Uh, corporate funds have dwindled in importance, and these are typically open only to employees at a particular firm, and many are much older than the superannuation guarantee itself. They've been around uh, many decades in some cases. So, um, so this just looks at the entities um, and basically how they've shrunk in the past five years, and you know, this is a good thing, I suppose. The industry is becoming more efficient. Um, so there's been significant consolidation. Uh, corporate funds in particular have, have folded. Um, so now there's about 150 of those. Uh, now, I have not put SMSFs on this chart <laughs> because there are 432,000 of them. <laughs> um, so, so we've got about, you know, kind of five, 400 or so entities managing the money in the kind of APRA-regulated sector. And then in the, in the self-managed sector, there's 432,000 um, trustees, uh, sorry, trusts, if you like. Um, now, I've also got a chart here on the average balances. Um, so, again, I've got the different the average account balances okay that's they're on the main axis of all these different types so you can see the self-managed super funds they are far far and away the wealthier people who manage those almost half a million dollars on average um, now then i've got the number of accounts is in bold above them so um, so you can see there that the retail industry funds, although the average balance is about twenty thousand dollars each and the industry is slightly less actually it's about nineteen thousand um, in terms of public policy importance, they are overwhelmingly the most important because they have all the accounts, basically. So that's where the vast majority of Australians have their money, either in an industry fund or a retail fund, overwhelmingly so. Um, so I'll now discuss some of the problems of the system, as I see it, the defects of superannuation. Um, so, f so firstly, the super system's purpose is confused in my view. It doesn't really know what it wants to be. So um, now the Henry Review consultation paper issued in late December the 2008, 15 years after super was made compulsory, is still asking questions like, what should the role of government be in assisting individuals to meet their retirement expectations? And, and which objectives are relevant in setting retirement incomes policy? I mean, you think that some of these things might have been sorted out. These are very fundamental questions. So it just goes to show that you know, it's, it's still quite confused. In my view, there are two justifications for government involvement in retirement provision. Uh, one is paternalistic, as I call it, and the other one is realistic, as I call it. So it probably surprises some people, but well, at least uh, some classical liberals anyway, it surprises some people, but the realistic justification for compulsory government enforced saving is well in keeping with classical liberal thought. So as Frederick Hayek pointed out in 1960, uh, once it becomes the recognised duty of the public to provide for the extreme needs of old age, etc., it seems an obvious corollary to compel them to ensure or otherwise provide against those common hazards. And then he goes on to say that it is not that people should be coerced to do what is in their interest, but that by neglecting to make provision, they would become a charge on the public. And so up to that point, the justification for the whole apparatus of social security can probably be accepted by the most consistent defenders of liberty. So that probably surprises a lot of people who would just think, oh no, Hayek would be for no government intervention. Well, that's, that's not true at all. I mean. Um, in short, what he's trying to say is that in a democracy, rational citizens will know that the government, whatever it might say in practice, will not let people starve, right? This is a democracy. And so there's an incentive for them to save less and consume more than they otherwise would. So that's quite a profound point. But the Australian superannuation system is definitely not designed to combat this moral hazard. It is predicated on the paternalistic justification, the second one I mentioned earlier. So for example, it's certainly not intended to pre-fund the Australian age pension. Uh, the eligibility requirements for the age pension are very generous. A couple can have over a million dollars in superannuation before they lose their entitlement to the pension, and they can have incomes up to $2,500 a fortnight before the age pension is withdrawn. So around 80% of people aged over 65 currently receive some or all of the age pension. And even when the existing super system is fully mature in about 2035, so, so by that I mean there's been workers in it with a 9% compulsory rate for about a full working life, um, the age pension is predicted to still make up over half of the retirement income of people earning average weekly earnings and almost a quarter of the retirement income of those on 2.5 times average weekly earnings. So I think that's quite staggering really. So the age pension is really very generous um, and, and in no way is, is 
compulsory superannuation somehow reducing the age pension, um, which, is, which is what a lot of people commonly think. And so even with stricter assets and income tests on the age pension, the existing system is ripe for manipulation because superannuation savings can be paid out as early as 55, at the age of 55, and much of these savings can be spent or can be reinvested to ensure that retirees are eligible for some of the age pension anyway at the age 65. Now one strategy, of course, is to use superannuation lump sum to purchase a more expensive principal residence, which is not included in the assets test, and, therefore, and then once you've done that, then you can go and uh, receive the full age pension and you can pass the house on to your children. So um, that's, a, that's one way of getting around it. And it's perfectly rational, but whether it's a good public policy is another question. Um, now, the second problem. Well, basically the second problem I see it is that the rate does not need to increase the 12%, and it looks as though this will be part of the system uh, kind of in a few weeks when this bill is passed in Parliament. In my view, this is very bad policy, and it's also totally unnecessary from a paternalistic perspective. In fact, it would also be roughly sufficient to pre-fund the age pension for most workers. So basically what I'm trying to say here is 9% is fine from both paternalistic perspective and also the realistic perspective. So, so let me just talk about the realistic one. And just a simple, a simple demonstration, a worker on median income, about $46,000 sorry, $46, a year, will make annual net compulsory super contributions, <coughs> compulsory, of, of $3,500 a year. Now those contributions made over 37 years, which is a typical working life, and if they're compounded at a very modest rate of 4% after fees and taxes, they'll produce a lump sum of about $300,000 in today's money. Uh, now that is, it turns out, that's the same cost as, at least the same theoretical cost as purchasing an age pension on the market. So basically, for someone on median wage, 9% is enough for them to pre-fund the entire pension for themselves. So I think that's, uh, that's quite a powerful point. Now, what about the paternalistic perspective? Well, it turns out that estimated replacement rates, so this is basically the fraction of your retirement income to your working life income per year, and it's basically the phrase that is commonly used in, in, the, in the literature on this topic to see, you know, basically how, um, so how much saving is going on. Uh, the replacement rates are satisfactory. Um, so consider this, when, uh, when only the age pension and compulsory superannuation contributions are considered, just those two things, the existing system, w when it's mature, will give a worker on a, on a median income a replacement rate of about 75% and someone on average earnings of about 65%. So given that costs are generally far less in retirement than when you're working, that's, that's I think, that is quite good. And also bear in mind that these rates take absolutely no account of individual circumstances uh, relating to inheritances or to additional voluntary saving that one might make or have, not to mention the ability to downsize one's house to and to spend some of the proceeds. So, so you'll often see in the press, and in fact, I think, I think Greg forwarded me something today just about all this, all this business about everyone's under saving and their superannuation accounts aren't big enough. All these analyses completely ignore the other money people have and the other assets they have, and it also completely ignores inheritances. And I mean, that's, that's obviously very stupid because I mean, everyone who's even, even partly rational will obviously anticipate some sort of inheritance perhaps. Um, now, increasing the superannuation guarantee, or the SG, is also, it's also unfair on uh, low-income workers. Uh, so remember, in the long run, burden of superannuation falls on the employees, not employers, in the long run. And the Henry Review certainly noticed this. They said, for most employees on low to middle incomes, 9% is perfectly satisfactory and provides a reasonable balance uh, between before and after um, retirement consumption. And it also rightly argued that increasing the SG would bear most heavily on low to middle income earners who are unlikely to be in a position to offset the increase in the superannuation guarantee by reducing their other savings. So that's also a powerful point and a point that's been completely ignored by a Labor government, which you know, is supposedly for low to middle income earners. Um, next, I want to reflect a bit on how, um, hang on. yeah, sorry, I just want to reflect a bit on how effective super is in the first place at increasing saving. Um, so if you consider this, you'll see that super is actually dwarfed by the value of, of dwellings. Um, so super is very big, yep, it's 1.3 trillion, right? But it's nowhere near as large as the value of household assets. And also households own other things as well. Um, they have washing machines and <laughs> things like that, the durables. Um, and then they have deposits and they hold shares outside super. So, so what I'm trying to say is he, uh, here, if we did not have compulsory super, obviously that column would not be there. And the question is, where would all that money be? Would it just not exist, or would it be in the other columns? So really, just a, just a thought experiment, really, for people. Um, I mean, I suspect a lot of it would be in the other columns, um, but you know, we'll never have a counterfactual. But 
Now the household saving ratio, also very interesting. I've showed it for quite a long period of time here. You can see that in the middle period when the SG rate was gradually increased from three to nine percent, the household saving plummeted. So that's in between those two vertical lines. Now since the GFC saving has increased dramatically, now it's measuring saving is actually very, very difficult. So I have to caveat all my comments with that. But the most obvious conclusion to draw from this graph is that the SGs mattered very little for anything, really. I mean, the, the, the line seems to have moved against it when it's been increased, and suddenly it's surged recently, and super's done nothing since 2002 in terms of the rate. So just, just something for you to consider when you hear about how you know, super is increasing the nation's savings, blah, blah, blah. Um, also, many countries around the world do not have compulsory saving schemes, but they still have extremely substantial pension assets. Um, so as I said earlier, it's about 90% of GDP here. The world average is about 75%. So not OECD average is about 75%. So not, not hugely different. And finally, here's a thought experiment that I think is interesting. And, and you can ask yourself this uh, right now. Does the existence of compulsory super make you think more or less about the adequacy of your retirement? So put another way, the age pension was the only government provided retirement allowance, and you knew that. Would you put more or less effort into thinking about how much you need to save for retirement? Now, there's no hard and fast answer, but I suspect that for many people, super lulls them into a false sense of preparedness because they know it's there. They don't think about it, but they know it's there in the background. And so it, in fact, reduces the amount that they think about saving. Um, and it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but it's certainly the case for me anyway. <laughs> so, um, now, my final criticism is the most serious. It is the cost of administering super. And superannuation is woefully expensive. Now, there are broadly two types of costs. There are operating costs and there are investment costs. Now, the, da the data on operating costs is, is the most reliable. You can see here that operating costs across all funds are about $8 billion a year, almost $700 per member of the labour force. That's one of the other lines there, or, or about $240 per year per account. Uh, and then more worryingly, that increase in cost per account is much faster than the increase in CPI over the same period. So the blue line has gone up faster than CPI. Uh, now, costs are typically measured in basis points. Um, so I'll, I'll be talking a lot about basis points later. And, and these are fractions of one percentage point. So current operating costs, measured as a total of all assets, are about 68 basis points a year. Now Deloitte Consulting did an investigation where they thought what, well they estimated what a reasonable operating expense would be, and they thought it, it should be between $66 and $150 a year per member. So you can see we're much higher than that. Um, <laughs> so um, now, now of course this is uh, the great problem here is that there are three accounts roughly per pe per person in Australia, which is obviously jacking up the cost very dramatically. Um, now investment costs are much harder to manage, uh, sorry, much harder to measure because many funds report their investment returns net of investment costs to APRA and so it's very, very hard to get a measure, a fair measure of, of investment costs. But the available data still paints a depressing picture. So if you look only at, well basically I'm looking only at industry and retail funds because like I said that's all that matters from a public policy perspective. So. The bottom two lines in this graph basically show the basis point cost over the two most recent four years that we've got data for. And this includes operating costs and investment costs, and so it's about 90 basis points. So almost one percentage point per year of the total assets is just gone in fees. Now Treasury estimated in their calculation that the average for people in default funds was 97 basis points a year, so not, not, not too dissimilar from that. Um, Remember, these are only reported expenses. Now, it's also very interesting to have a look at the rates of return of the various classes of funds okay, over long periods. So I've just chosen the four, well, basically the only four that we can measure. Um, now, these are over two periods, um, so 96 to 2006, the golden year, to the golden decade, if you like, of returns, and then the more recent one, which hasn't been so happy. Um, now, these are net of all taxes and fees and everything. So you can see that the public funds have done very well, the corporate funds also. Uh, industry and retail are both the laggards, but it's the retail funds which have done particularly badly. So this may be because a lot of their returns are actually net of investment costs, which don't make their way into the investment costs that are reported to APRA. So at least that's one theory. So anyway, you see that these, and these, these are not real returns either, I might add, so you should lop CPI off that. <laughs> so it's not particularly, not particularly good then. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> anyway, uh, where was I? Sorry.
So the same uh, report from uh, Deloitte, uh, they also investigated appropriate investment costs, and the range is enormous. So if, if money is passively invested, so, right? So, so there are basically two ways money can be invested. Passive investment, where you just, where you just basically put the money into some sort of a tracker fund, which basically just tries to mimic the stock exchange and doesn't actually take a view on where it's going. That is passive investment, it's extremely cheap. And then there's active investment where you pay hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, people with degrees to try to manage your money and beat the market. Um, now, passive investment can uh, cost three or four basis points a year, right? It's incredibly, incredibly cheap. Whereas um, active management is more up near the 60 and 70 basis points a year. So you can imagine over a whole lifetime of saving, this makes a very, very dramatic difference to your final balance. Um, so, so the vast majority of superannuation money is actively managed in Australia. And I think this is—I think this is a real scandal, actually. I think this is the greatest scandal of all, actually, in in finance in Australia. Is that is that ordinary people's money is actively invested, which is totally absurd. Um, you know, for a long period of time, 40 years, basically, you want your money. I mean, if you're actively investing over 40 years, you're kind of saying that, that your fund manager is going to beat the market, for, you know, kind of consistently for 40 years, which is just completely absurd. Um, well, that's not true. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Um, so, what was I saying? Um, yeah, theoretically, it's impossible for most fund managers to beat the market. It's almost impossible for any fund manager to beat it consistently over 40 years. Um, and so, just uh, cynically, I think, I mean, I think the reason why it's so actively managed, and this is uh, perhaps very, very cynical, but I think it's because um, so active fund management is in the very strong financial interest of every single uh, financial interest in superannuation, except for the fund member himself or herself. Um, and it, it certainly is, because the fees generated are, are really very significant. Um, I also think it helps explain why so much of our money is invested in shares. And this, I mean, across the OECD, Australian pension funds have the third highest allocation to shares. Uh, about 45% of money in pension funds is in <coughs> shares. Now, shares are a very high-risk um, uh, investment, right? So you'd think for, uh, for pension funds, especially when so many people are approaching retirement, that you might have more in fixed interest, but only 15% in fixed interest, 50% in shares. And yet these are balanced default funds. You know, balanced, they're all called balanced, and balanced sounds great, doesn't it? Oh, I'll get in a balanced fund. You get half your money in shares, basically. Um, so I think that's also a bit of a scandal, too. And if you look at other countries, their pension funds have vastly more of the assets invested in fixed interest, which, of course, don't really deviate very much. Sure, there's not going to be huge returns, um, sort of occasionally, but also the returns will be pretty flat and reliable, and this is why so many Australians are very upset over the past few years, because they've lost, on paper at least, tens of thousands of dollars, ordinary people, and I think it's largely because it's like actively managed and it's all in shares. Um, now, I briefly want to have a look at what's been proposed. So firstly, Henry Review. So Henry made a strong case that lifting SG from nine is inefficient and unfair, like I've said. He said the preservation age should be lifted to 67 from 60 to match the new age pension age, which will be in from 2023. So from 2023, the age pension, you'll uh, only be able to get it at age 67. Um, am I going for time? I'm all right. I've still got 10 minutes, don't I? Yep. Um, so uh, the biggest recommendation was to change the taxation of superannuation in quite a fundamental way. So right now, um, a flat 15% tax on contributions is levied. So we don't really have a 9% superannuation guarantee. That's, that's, that's also another failure. We have a 7.65% superannuation guarantee. Because 15% of the money is automatically taken away in tax. Right? So it's 7.65% superannuation guarantee. Um, so basically, Henry thought, let's get rid of that tax. We'll tax all the contributions at marginal tax rates. Right? And then, through the tax system, everyone will get a tax credit up to a certain level. And, and he thought that 20 cents on the dollar was reasonable. But you know, that can be varied. Um, now, this uh, is a very significant change, and basically, it's a progressive change. I mean, it's it's one I support because currently, if you're if you're on a 45% marginal tax rate, then to put money in super, your tax rate goes down to 15%. So it's a huge, huge benefit. Now, if you're on a 17% a tax rate, then you basically get no benefit at all from putting money in super. And I think if we're going to have tax concessions, then surely it should be targeted at people who are least likely to save rather than those that are just going to shift the form of their saving from one thing to the other. I mean, that just seems very inefficient use of public money to do that. And so that's, that's one of the recommendations. Um, another is to halve the superannuation earnings tax to 7.5% from 15. So contributions are taxed at 15. Earnings are also taxed at 15 at the moment. 
Um, and Henry said to halve it, which, which is a good thing because the compounding effect of earnings is extremely powerful over 40 years, and so it's good to have the lowest uh, possible tax on earnings. Um, now Henry argues that these recommendations increase national saving by almost 1%. He also argues that they increase saving by more than increasing the SG to 12%. So but Henry says that his, his tax tweaks are far more effective than, than the government's plan to increase uh, the guarantee from 9 to 12. Um, it's also important to note uh, that both Henry's and the government's proposals are a net cost to government. So this is also very interesting. Most people assume that lifting the SG even if they admit that it might be tough on some low-income workers, blah, 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 they think, oh, well, but it's, you know, it's a hard-nosed decision for the budget. You know, it's going to get down public expenditure because people will have more of their own savings. This is complete rubbish. It's actually a net cost to the budget, all right? So increasing the guarantee to 12%, it's not, it's not helping the government in the future. The income tax loss from the compulsory contributions is so great because, remember, a lot of people are getting their income tax at the moment at 45. When it changes, it'll go down to 15 that is so enormous that it far, far outweighs the reduction in the age pension outlays. So, so it's widely regarded in the press that this is a hard-nosed decision. It's not. It's actually a cost to government, which means that all other taxes will have to go up, right, to pay for it, ultimately. Um, so, can I get on to Cooper now, the second one? So, Cooper is enormous. It's got 10 chapters. It's got 177 recommendations of which the government has supported most of them, I might add, which is good. This is generally a very sensible document. The biggest change, uh, by far, the first chapter is this thing called My Super, which will be available from the 1st of July 2013. Now, the idea of My Super is that these funds will be basic, they'll have low costs, they'll suit fund members who don't want to think about their super very much, and they'll probably apply to about 80% of people with super, ultimately. Uh, crucially, the only way you can be listed as a default fund in the modern awards is if you're a MySuper fund, right? So there'll be a very strong incentive to s satisfy the MySuper criteria, because if you don't, you won't be listed in the awards, right? Which is a real uh, gold mine, a rivers of gold there if you're listed in the awards. Um, now, to be eligible, there'll be a raft of criteria about transparency, about governance, about fee structures, insurance levels, contributions and benefits rules. The trustees will have an explicit legislative obligation to do that. Um, which, you know, sounds, sounds very reasonable. Uh, they'll also have to actively analyse every year and they'll have to prove to APRA that they've got sufficient scale to continue operating on their own. So basically it's meant to encourage big, the big funds. Now all these prescriptions are meant to lead to lower fees and better returns. So Cooper envisages that my super funds, as a result of all these prescriptions, might eventually have an annual cost of 66 basis points uh, compared to the 97 that we currently have. So that's a, that's a, large, that's a large fall. Um, now, such an outcome would improve balances of, of the average Joe by $40,000 is final accumulation. Now, I'm very sympathetic to the My Super changes. I think, you know, the heart's in the right place. They're an improvement from the existing situation, but I'm not actually optimistic that fees will fall by as much as they predict because they haven't changed the fundamental problem, and that is that members' lethargy towards their superannuation fees will be exactly the same. In fact, it will be even more than it currently is because there'll be this thing called My Super, so the government's taking care of it. No one will think about their super. So there'll be no real pressure on the funds to reduce their fees. I mean, sure, they'll reduce them a little bit, but there's no cap on, on fees. So I just think it's wishful thinking. Um, you know, time will prove me wrong or right, but I, I think I'll be right. So um, now the other nine chapters are on all sorts of various interesting things. I think the most interesting one is that at the moment, if you're in certain industry funds, and indeed some retail funds too, you'll get a statement saying, you know, 24% of your money is in Australian shares. What shares? You have no, no way of finding out. Um, it'll say it's in property, which is a particularly notable with union funds, sorry, with industry funds. Um, it'll say unlisted property, but you will not be able to find out what you actually own. So I think that's a real problem. Um, so basically Cooper said every six months all the big funds should list in great detail what your money is invested in and I think that's perfectly reasonable for you to know where your money is going and also it's great for journalists too because they'll be able to do good stories about what certain funds are investing in and yeah so they should because this is you know huge amounts of money here being invested on, on other people's behalf. So just to recap I'm just about to conclude so some of the problems with super that we've covered tonight it's, it's uh, too expensive both the operating costs and the investment costs not enough money going to saving maybe, uh, too many funds, lack of scale, uh, too complex, all these things. So, that, so basically my proposal solves all these problems. <laughs> it's, it's actually a magic proposal. I think it's an extremely elegant uh, solution to this problem. It also requires no new bureaucracy or additional regulation whatsoever. So the regulators don't uh, get any more money. So it just simply is about competition. So 
Now, I haven't mixed up my slides. I want to show the insurance cost. I want to show these basic insurance costs, right? So this is the private health insurance. This is how much it costs for basic cover for the four major private health insurers each week. Um, now, I know this because earlier in the year I changed I changed insurers, and, um, and so I looked around, and I, I of course, chose the $10.50 one. <laughs> um, they all offer the same product. Now, now, the interesting thing about this is that this is a market where you have to pay the fee out of your after-tax income. Like, like most goods, you have to pay fees out of your after-tax income, right? So you're particularly careful, or at least as careful as you'd be, uh, for any expenditure about how much you're spending, right? So this market is incredibly competitive. They're all basically the same cost. And I might add the websites are incredibly clear. I mean, insurance is a fairly complicated product. In, in fact, far more complicated than managing your money, vastly more complicated. And yet it is far simpler to work out how much it costs, the fee structure. You know, why is that? There's a massively strong incentive for these firms to make their website beautifully clear. Otherwise, they will lose people, right? Um, so the pricing information is very clear. The prices are also very low. You can get a quotation that suits your circumstances in less than 30 seconds. And switching from one fund to the other, one of these funds, is extremely easy. They do it all for you. You just do it online. I just went online, went to FBF, pressed a few buttons. It was all taken care of for me. It was great. Um, so if the superannuation system operated like this, um, you know, we'd all be vastly better off. But you know, press, so basically my solution is, <laughs> is basically just amend the legislation so that the parliament should make it illegal for trustees to take any fees, both operating or expense fees, from your contributions or from your funds, right? It just can't happen, right? So where do they get the money from? Well, from you now. So instead, superannuation funds would need to take the fees from our after-tax incomes, right? Suddenly, people would be being hit with these bills, which are horrific, and they would be shocked. Absolutely, because it is shocking. And, um, and suddenly, there would be a frenzy of competition. In indeed, it's impossible to overstate how much this would shake the industry up, right? It would be, it would strike sheer terror, this in Martin Place, sheer terror. Um, because suddenly there'd be massive consolidation. All investment strategies would go from active to passive, basically all of them, because it's so cheap to manage funds passively. So you'd end up with a huge reduction. And that, that chart I showed earlier would just collapse with the expenses, would absolutely collapse. Um, and I think you'd end up with an industry going from 97 basis points to about 5 or 10. Now, this is going to make a massive, massive difference to Australian savings. Huge. And it hasn't, I, haven't, I haven't touched the SG rate at all. No one's saving anymore. It's just simply getting rid of all the fat. And there is so much fat. So let's say it's 100 basis points of savings. That's about $100,000 extra in the average member's account over his working life, right? And we haven't adjusted the SG. Haven't even changed, haven't changed any tax rate, indeed. We've just simply changed the framing of the fees. That's all. People are just paying it just like they pay their private health insurance. Just imagine how expensive private health insurance would be if you didn't pay it out of your, your income now. You paid it out of some future income. It would be incredibly expensive. The fees would be massive, right? And the insurers would be making a mint. And indeed, what I think will also happen is that the notion of charging people based on the size of assets invested, that's, that's kind of a bit silly when you think about it. I mean, I think that would go away and you just get fixed prices like $10 or $5 a week to manage your your super. I mean, you know, why should it cost twice as much to invest 500000 as it costs to invest 250000 No reason whatsoever. It's just that it's very lucrative to do it that way. Um, so that, but that's basically the end. Um, so yeah, my little solution, by far the best, but it, it will definitely not happen, I assure you, <laughs> because it would be a disaster for certain, certain vested interests. So anyway, thank you.